thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And this video will be the introduction to The Phoenix by Manly P. Hall. As the repositories of a universal sacred learning, the sanctuaries of the pagan gods were protected and served by hierarchies of illumined priests who, consecrated to the spirit of truth, labored unceasingly to acquaint evolving humanity with the dull mystery of human origin and destiny. These ancient temples have crumbled away. The holy orders from that day vanished from the earth. A new priestcraft serves the gods and a new laity gathers at the clanging of the great bronze bells. The mysteries of antiquity have seemingly perished. The faith, however, of the Golden Age, the first religion of man, can never wholly die. In all its pristine purity, it is preserved even to this day and may be recovered by anyone who will devote his life to this supreme and holy task. It is not decreed that man should be so easily deprived of that which is his own. For even in this generation, which is a stranger to the gods, he who will follow in the footsteps of the neophyte of old may still revive the priceless heritage of truth and light. Amid the bustle and confusion of our great economic era, there are still mystic master builders like Paul and initiated philosophers like Plato, and these, in common with the priest of an older world, still serve and protect the sacred fires of aspiration burning upon the high altars of humanity, unrecognized and unappreciated in a generation motivated by personal interest. Both these doctrines and their priestly keepers have preserved an inviolable secrecy. The divine traditions still survive, and the wise of one generation still pass on the wise of the next that body of mystic truths, which is the leaven of civilization and for the lack of which mankind must inevitably perish. As we turn the voluminous pages of history, we read in glorious rubricated lettering the record of nations that have passed away, of heroes who lie in unknown and unhonored graves, of conquerors bedecked with the trappings of the mighty and wearing the loyal wreath of victory, marching down the corridors of time. All these have vanished in a common oblivion. We pause for a moment to pay homage to the great that was Egypt, the magnificence that was Greece, and the glory that was Rome, as upon molding headstones we read the epitaph of their rise and fall, how each in turn bowed its noble head to the inevitable and went its way. From this graveyard of dead ambitions, we turn to the nations of today, each a proud people, each intoxicated with the power that has brought what we chose to term a measure of success. Yet not one of these nations knows which will be the first to draw the somber robes of its shroud about it and join the ghostly order of peoples that are dead. Like guests at some Borgian fest, they sit with treason in every heart and poison in every cup. Every historian, consequently, should be a philosopher, for only the philosopher is able to see the immutability of that universal law by which the actions of men are regulated. There is a destiny which shapes our ends, causes invisible produce, their effects, and these effects, in turn becoming new causes, reap fresh harvesties according to their kind. The patience and sincerity with which the wise face life springs from their deeper comprehension of these fundamental issues. The wise can be patient because that which cannot be wroth in time can be fulfilled in eternity. The discernment of the sage can see beneath the chaos of competitive ethics and the babble of vanity the presence of a divine justice. Though repeatedly outraged, nature is ever sufficient to the achievement of her own ends. One by one, the cathedrals of injustice are stormed by the inevitable and fall. Amid confusion and kaleidoscopic change stands the immovable one.
to whose measureless existence comings and goings are but incidental. He is the pillar envisioned by the Samian sage which, rising from the depths of space, is the strong support of the universe. The altar of the everlasting one is lifted up in the midst of the world, and upon it flickers throughout all duration the flame of his covenant. If we study the history of vanished races, we will discern the cause of their destruction. When a nation ceases to serve the beautiful, it has already begun to die. When a cause departs from truth, that cause has already failed. When glutted with success and tyrannical with power, like the fabled princes of Atlantis, men no longer love the beautiful and serve the good. They are destroyed by the weight of their own iniquity. The old writings tell us that black magic overshadowed Egypt, perverted and licentious. The priests served the great specters invoked by their incantations. They called up monsters by their spells and fabricated false gods who were but demons in disguise. The heavenly light upon the temple altars grew fainter and fainter. The truth became less evident as error increased in power. Lust and pride likewise undermined the solidarity of Greece and wild debauchery caused the streets of Rome to run with blood and wine. Being but men, the priests of the temples were infected with the common plague and lost the mystic word of power, the name ineffable. Though an almost infinite diversity of creeds has come into manifestation since the primitive doctrine of the first ages, these creeds have sought to achieve a single end, i.e. the restatement of the primitive revelation which, according to the doctrines of the Kabbalah, was revealed to the patriarchs by the angelic schools. A hermetic philosopher, writing anonymously in the 16th century, declared in his interpretation of the Book of the Seven Seals that there existed in the heavens above the circles of the earth a university of divine knowledge a sort of college of celestials. Before his relapse state, Adam himself had studied in the school of God, and when later he was banished to wander the corporeal sphere, he was privileged by a benign providence to preserve a faint remembrance of those transcendental doctrines that had been imparted to him by the heavenly host. Having inclined themselves towards material concerns, Adam's descendants became tillers of the fields and builders of cities. These natural enterprises established new orders of learning concerned with the instructions of the material world, the wisdom of God and his host, and the secrets of spiritual philosophy slowly faded from the conscious mind of the race to remain, however permanently impressed upon the subconscious intellect. The divine arts and sciences thus came to be forgotten and in their place was erected the structure of the liberal arts, sciences and crafts. Thus upon the footings of worldly wisdom, empire was established. The sages no longer retired into the wilderness to receive that heavenly wisdom with which the messengers of that most high nourished the hungry and soul. In the terms of that same quaint philosopher quoted, but whose name has not been preserved, the angels still attend the celestial school with appropriate humility and contribution, but men in their pride rejected the divine instruction, were expelled from the university of the elect, and set up a false knowledge upon the earth in defiance to the eternal truths they could no longer comprehend. Such traditions, while of dubious authenticity, still embody a germ of truth which, though ridiculed by the sophist, will not be rejected by the scholar. Who can deny that mankind has defied the laws of universal order and sought to set up the supremacy of his own mandates? We have all erred from the paths of wisdom, as is well witnessed by the misery everywhere apparent in mortal affairs. Men of more exalted vision than the rest have sensed the real cause of human unhappiness, and in every age the strongest of these have gone forth as reformers, sages, seers, and prophets, seeking to impart to a thoughtless world the priceless treasures of understanding. But the path of reformation is hard, and martyrdom is the reward that a diluted world meets out to those who would waken it from the coma of its materialism. 
If we turn to the lives of the great philosophers and sages, we will discover them to be bound together in a common fraternity of purpose. We will furthermore discover that these men were initiates of secret societies, either pagan or Christian, and that their revelations, so called, were but restatements of the sacred documents expounded by the mysteries. The Rosicrucian Rose was Martin Luther's crest. The Comte de Saint Germain initiated his disciples into the doctrines of the Illuminati and Freemasons in caves along the Rhine. Claude Saint Martin, the unknown philosopher, received his life, if we are to believe the authorities, from the Bohemian brothers in the dark fastnesses of the Black Forest. Then came the divine Cagliostro, defined by Pike as the agent of the Templars and well called by Brother Evans the Masonic Martyr. Over a hundred years have passed since Cagliostro languished in the dungeon of San Leo, but the prejudice which destroyed him still remains, fleeing from the wrath of enthroned ignorance and living in cellars and garnets, the hermetic philosophers of the Middle Ages preserved as a sacred trust for a better day those doctrines that had been entrusted to them from remote antiquity, vilified by such epithets as sorcerer and necromancer, these venerable adepts perpetuated at enormous personal sacrifice the mysteries of the pagan fire philosophy destined by the gods never to pass away. The names of these ancient masters are revered by us today. We are amazed at the powers which they possessed. We bow humbly before their erudition. We are fascinated by the adventures which befell them in the fulfillment of their trust. We marvel at the profundity yet magnificent simplicity of their beliefs and the almost divine patience with which they tended the flame of philosophy and bore the burden burden of an inflicting age. Roger Bacon, Nicholas Flamel, Paracelsus, Helvetius, von Helmont, Francis Bacon, Elias Ashmole, Robert Flood, John Hayden, Eugenius Philalethes, and a host of other patrons of the arts and sciences, men of deep learning and wide experience, these illustrious men, as adepts of the magnum opus, look to their more fortunate brothers of this less hazardous century for a fuller measure of accomplishment and devotion. The adepts of the past have came to be regarded as almost mythological personalities, whose lives and words, fantastically distorted, have been woven into fairy tales for the amusement of the children of the race. What is folklore but a history of mysterious happenings, which historiographers fear to include in their prosaic records of a people, yet in spite of a definite and almost untiring effort to obliterate from the memory of the world everything pertaining to the mystery of magic or the super sciences, the ghost of the ancient thaumaturgist cling tenaciously to the substance of our imaginations. We are obsessed by these elder spirits. They refuse to be forgotten. They demand their due for their very work's sake. And in spite of ourselves, we not only remember them, but also the broad measure of their accomplishments. We shudder even in the smugness of our materiality when we realize that our present civilization rests upon the broad shoulders of demigods and heroes half divine. Even as the substance of our history is established upon the ephemerality of myth and legend, and so we stand together in all the splendor of our various discomfitures, miserably educated, distressingly cultured, oblivious to all that is essential to right living, and painfully ignorant of those vital essentials which only philosophic insight can reveal, each of us in a 20th century Faust. Goethe's hero speaks for each of us in the immortal lines, and here I stand with all my lore, a fool no wiser than before. Why must we continually reject those sublime truths proffered to us out of the past? Why do we turn our backs with scorn upon splendid doctrines of other ages, declaring only the present to be real and the past but idle superstition? When Plato affirms the inner mysteries of life, 
What modern upstart in his shallowness dares to refute him? When Cicero bears witness to the efficacy of the mysteries, who of this generation is qualified to say him nay? When the superlative intellects of all ages have united in a common adoration of the secret doctrine, revering above all other men those initiated into the mysteries, how can we in the vanity of our own conceits ridicule our superiors and then go on living worse than the men we scoff at? It is fitting that we should honor those who illumined intellection, has brought wisdom out of the obscurity of the first ages and preserved the unbroken chain of philosophic tradition through all the vicissitudes of changing time. Nor should we honor them by words alone, but rather by so living and serving the great truths of life that the sacrifices of the first philosophers should not be in vain. There is but one appropriate propitiation, one acceptable offering and that is right use. These seers and sages of antiquity established the institutions in which the mysteries of philosophy were revealed. They demonstrated to mankind the true way of all permanent achievement. They led the neophytes to the gateway of the intellectual sphere, where truth dwells in the midst of the wise. After sojourning with humanity for their allotted span, these ministers of the sovereign good closely drew their robes of gold about them and passed into the inner sanctuary, the adytum of the everlasting house, from which none cometh out again. They not only taught, but because they were adepts, they lived their doctrines and their lives as well as their words revealed the fullness of their understanding. The dying Buddha declared to his disciples that he left behind him three jewels and that through contemplation of them all men might achieve to the supreme blessedness. These heavenly gems, radiant with an indwelling splendor, were the life of the Buddha, the word of the Buddha, and the order of the Buddha. While these jewels continue upon the earth, the monk in his saffron robe shall not be left without hope of achievement. The Buddha established the way, and in his footsteps millions have walked the path of attainment. The Buddha has entered his nirvana. The Christ has departed to his father. Zarathustra has returned to his flame. They have all gone, each to his own end, as determined by his works, but their accomplishments endure. They were the wise in the truest sense of the word. They were builders of a divine house, architects of a lasting civilization, artisans skilled beyond all other men. Time may pass away, history be swallowed up in eternity. Nations crumble, the world itself, vanish into the flame from whence it came. But if there be anything that will endure the conflagration, which marks the boundary of duration, it is understanding. If any man have a hope, understanding is the substance of that hope. If there be immortality, understanding renders its achievement possible. Perfection of understanding is ultimate perfection. Understanding is eternal, incapable of destruction or change. Therefore, these masters of understanding will never cease to be, but as nine and forty flames will gather as a blazing aureole about the sovereign flame which burns forever. Invoke by your contemplation the shadows of the master builders who have gone before. In your dream, behold the marching conquerors passing triumphantly down the royal arches of time. There is the dark-skinned Orpheus, his face illumined with a radiant ecstasy as he draws from the seven-string lyre, symbolic of the harmony of his own being, the measureless harmonies of the spheres. Besides him is the Egyptian Hermes, the thrice greatest, the beloved son of wisdom, bearing in one hand the Caduceus, whose warring serpents have ceased to struggle and holding aloft in the other hand the glistening and glimmering emerald tablet bearing the revelation of the immutable law. In this vision out of the past, behold dimly the blue Krishna, the beloved child of the flute and conch shell, who on the battlefield of Kurukshetra leaned from his heavenly chariot and delivered to Arjuna, Prince of Men, the Bhagavad Gita, the song of the ever-living Lord, behind Krishna and leaning on an iron staff, stands the sublime Buddha, with yellow robe and shaven head, Lord of Humility and the Perfect Way, Asia's Light, 
and the giver of the good law. Behind Gautama stalks grave Pythagoras, his head bent over and his long beard upon his breast. There also is the Syrian master, Jesus, his brow serene with the calm of self-mastery, but his face saddened by the sins committed in his name. His shade appears for an instance and is gone again. After him come a host of others. Confucius, the sage of China, walks side by side with Lao Tzu, the mystic of Tao and the perfect way. Great thundering Odin follows, holding high his gunyer, the spear cut from the branches of the tree of life and high is flung the black banner of Muhammad, planted by him in the courtyard of the Kaaba, after he had overthrown the 360 idols and reconstructed Mecca to the living God. Far at the unknown beginning is the half-distinguishable specter of Zarathustra, lying with the spear wound in his back, and Moses, the strong man of Israel, alone in death upon the dreary hills of Moab. The Mysteries of the Holy Grail The line is endless. These masters of other days, they were men above creed and clan, nobler than those distinctions with which we separate the common aspirations of humanity. They served not idols, but ideals. Theologies grew up about them, yet each was greater than the order which he founded. From the same place they all came forth, the spirit of their doctrines was identical and, and each finally mingled his own smaller self with the common accomplishment. Among the great teachers of humanity there was neither superiority or inferiority, there was simply difference, not difference of purpose but of method, not divergence of end, but of way. Hand in hand they marched down the ages, each revered the other, for all true greatness loves greatness, and only littleness hates. The same overshadowing consciousness that had made them truly great had revealed to them not only the brotherhood of all life, but, more than this, the identity of all life. As never before, the secret doctrines of the ancients intrigued the philosophically minded. The insufficient creeds and dogmas that survived the Renaissance are fast crumbling before the crushing force of rationalism, and men who were once of different faiths are now united in the common questing of a more reasonable code of living. Though the objects of his veneration may change, man remains essentially a religious animal. He may break away from the limitations and fertilities of ecclesiastical schisms, but he cannot escape the inherent urge to venerate his creator. Ever surrounded by irrefutable evidence of an abiding destiny, the thinking man is powerless to resist that dominating impulse to propitiate in some appropriate appropriate manner, the mysterious spirit abiding in the furthermost and the innermost. Throughout the first ages of humanity, certain divinely instituted mysteries were the intermediates between man and his maker. These august institutions were the custodians of a superior learning of which the human mind was inclined towards the way of truth and understanding. But as nations verged towards materialism and the peoples of the earth ceased to venerate the sovereign good, so these sacred schools gradually became corrupted. Those which through compromise escaped utter annihilation remained as perverse spirits to impede the very progress which they once sponsored. Politically we are disillusioned as to have the divine right of temporal monarchies and ecclesiastically as to the apostolic succession of the spiritual elect, thus disheartened by the sophistry of an unenlightened age. We turn from Vergaris to renew our endless search for the substance of truth. We would follow in the footsteps of those prophets of earlier days who, ascending the mountaintops of wisdom, beheld their maker face to face in the midst of the lightnings and heard the deep rumbling of his voice even above the far-flung echoes of the thunder. In his rocky caverns upon the slopes of Mahira, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, prayed that the pure religion of the first patriarch might again be revealed to a humanity bowed down in sackcloth and ashes by the weight of numberless afflictions. The strong man of Arabia, 
stretched forth his arms into the darkness and pled with the night that the wisdom which abides in space might again come forth to lead men from idolatry back to the worship of the one God, and who must be served in spirit and in truth. Too long have we wandered in the veil of shadows, graveling before phantoms of our own creation and worshipping ghost and specters. Too long have we been afraid to lift our eyes to the radiant countenance of our creator, lest we be blinded by the awful light of truth. Too long have we prostrated ourselves abjectly at the feet of gilded men, bestowing upon mortals that homage reserved for the gods alone. Too long has the shortness of our vision made gods of men and men's of God. The darkest pages of history are those upon which are traced the records of men's faith. In the great march of nations and beliefs, death has ever ridden in the vanguard, loosing upon the earth the horrors described by Milton. Men have sung their hymns of hate, and in their hearts they have tired of gory splendor. Enough of the god who marches with arms of ambition and stands upon the battlefield surrounded by the bodies of the slain. A disillusioned humanity, wary of its own mistakes, turns again in despair to the mysterious emptiness of about it, an emptiness which seems to be the abiding place of a mighty spirit. In all this panorama of confusion and error, space alone seems capable of gentle comprehension. In extremities such as now confront mankind, the ages have demonstrated that it is natural for the more serious-minded individual to depart from commerce and industry and turn to philosophy. Verging from mental possessions, he inclines his mind to the all-satisfying reason. There is scant solace in our ducats when the real issues of life are at stake. The wise man knows that the glamour of so-called fortune, but complicates the many uncertainties of temporal affairs. There is much pathos in that envy with which we gaze upon the placid face of the sage. How is it that but a few achieve to the composure of the wise? What utter misery is the lot of the many? What is the essence of that mysterious learning which not only enables man to discover peace, but also endows him with such surpassing attributes that we are prone to accredit him with qualities but little inferior to a god? By what procedure is that wisdom acquired which not only reveals the end towards which all natures are being swept by an irresistible destiny, but also transfigures the human soul with the the light of an all-pervading good. There is a science, real to a few and mythological to many, preserved from a remote age for him who has become what John Hayden, the Rosicrucian calls, a servant of God and a secretary of nature. In an Egyptian ritual, the Book of the Master, it is written that ultimately death is swallowed up in light, and through the disciples of philosophy, humanity can be caused to rise, phoenix-like from the dead ashes of materiality, to mingle its lesser mind with the eternal reason. The elements of such an accomplishment constitute the natural religion of man, that unwritten document which has ever been the spiritual bread of the wise, and of which if a man should eat, he will never hunger again. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.